Hebrews 10, verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came to the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure." Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written for me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, 
I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him." But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Chapter 10 is a continuation of the ideas presented in chapter 9. One could argue that this is an unfortunate chapter break because the first verse of chapter 10 is connected to the last verse of chapter 9. Notice there, verse 28 of chapter 9, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. For, since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. So chapter 9 concluded by teaching us that Jesus is going to return. He will save those who are eagerly waiting for him, and judgment is certainly coming when Jesus returns. And then in verse 1 of chapter 10, we see that the law of Moses, again, only a shadow of the good things to come. The law of Moses is not the ultimate reality. So since the law of Moses was just a shadow of the good things, it can never make perfect those who draw near by the sacrifices that are offered annually. It simply was not the purpose of the law of Moses to perfect the worshipers. The law was looking forward to the good things to come, that is, sacrifices that can bring the forgiveness of sins. Think about it. If the law of Moses could perfect the worshiper, then the sacrificial system of the law of Moses would have never stopped. We would continue to offer animal sacrifices on altars to God. I'm so glad we're not in the Mosaic system any longer. But as the writer points out, the law of Moses could never make us complete. It could never put us in a right relationship once we have sinned. It could not perfectly cleanse us. 
Verse 2 tells us that if the law of Moses perfected the people, they would no longer have a consciousness of sin. However, that is not what the law of Moses does. Rather than remove the guilt, the repeated sacrifices remind the worshipers of the guilt of their sins. One commentary records that the repetition in sacrifice demonstrates the ongoing grip of sin, which is demonstrated in verse 3. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. This verse has been often misunderstood. Many have read verse 3 to mean that God kept remembering the sins of the people year after year. I have, in fact, heard it taught that every year God remembered the sins of the people. That is, that the sacrifice of atonement was made, and God forgot their sins until the following year. But that is not at all what the writer of Hebrews is teaching. The writer is not telling us that God remembered their sins. Rather, the worshipers, those worshiping, remembered their sins. The worshipers understood that the sacrifices of animals did not take away their sins. The sacrifices reminded them of their sins and did not cleanse their conscience. Remember, the writer has made that known in the last chapter. In Hebrews 9 and verse 9, According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that it cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. Therefore, according to verse 4 here, the worshipers knew that it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The law of Moses was a shadow of a coming sacrifice that would take away sins. If the law of Moses could take away sins and cleanse the consciences of the worshipers, again, the sacrifices would still be offered to this day. But the sacrifices simply reminded the worshipers of the guilt of their sins and did not take away sins. Consequently, verse 5, when Christ came into the world, the writer now proves a point that sacrifices were insufficient to deal with removing our sins. And so we have the illustration of Jesus and the quotation of Old Testament scripture. Specifically here, Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. Psalm 40 is a song of salvation and deliverance. Rather than quoting these words and attributing them to David, the writer of Hebrews attributes the words as spoken by Christ. This is a conversation between Christ and Father. When Christ was to come in the flesh, these are the words of that conversation. The Father did not want more animal sacrifices and offerings. The answer was in the body prepared for Christ. The sacrifice of Christ would be the answer for sins. God did not take pleasure in burnt offerings and sin sacrifices. God took pleasure in the perfect obedience of Jesus. That has always been the true concern of God and his, and his full desire. In the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel 15 and 22, Samuel records, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. Jesus came to do the will of the Father, something no human had ever accomplished previously and would never accomplish later. Only Jesus was able to completely do the will of the Father, which leads to verses 9 and 10 here. Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus came to do God's will. What was God's will? To take away the first covenant and establish a second covenant through which we can truly be cleansed. Now, the writer spent a lengthy amount of time teaching us that Jesus is high priest, which means there must be a new law. Jesus completes God's will and sets aside the first covenant and brings the second covenant, fulfilling Jeremiah's prophecy, which was recorded in Hebrews chapter 8. The second covenant cleanses our sins. The second covenant makes us holy. The second covenant, the sacrifices of the second covenant have been made once for all 
to take care of sins. Notice the contrast in verse 11. Priests serve daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which could never take away sins. Jesus offered for all time one single sacrifice for sins, and then he sat down at the right hand of God. A clear contrast is being made. The priests stand daily, but Jesus sits at the right hand of God. Notice this image again of the earthly tabernacle. We've looked at several images of the tabernacle this week. But did you notice something that was not in any of these pictures of these tabernacles? Lots of different artists, lots of different renderings of the tabernacle. But every one of them has one thing in common, particularly. What's missing? What's missing is there's no chairs. No chairs in the tabernacle. And why is that? Was it an oversight? No. Priests did not sit down. There was work to be accomplished while in the tabernacle. With Jesus, however, the work has been done. There is no more work left to do. Jesus has sat down at the right hand of God. It is a place of honor and a place of power. And what is Jesus doing sitting at the right hand of God? He's waiting. Waiting from the time until his enemies are put under his feet. Verse 13. We'll see more about that when we get to the letter to the 1 Corinthians. Let me skip down to verse 19 here. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That was a long sentence there, three verses long. Notice here we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. We have the privilege of following Jesus, our trailblazer, into the heavenly tabernacle, into the presence of God. The sacrifice of Jesus has opened the way to God. He is our high priest. He has torn the veil away so we can approach God. So what do we do? Verse 22, we come near. Come near to God with a sincere heart. Verse 23, we hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. God can be trusted to keep his promises. And again, that's been the theme of Hebrews. Don't give up. Don't fall back. Don't waver. Don't quit. Do not neglect the salvation that you have received. And then verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Robert Schuller tells a story about a banker who always tossed a coin in the cup of a legless beggar who sat on the street outside the bank. But unlike most people, the banker would always insist on getting one of the pencils the man had beside him. You are a merchant, the banker would say, and I always expect to receive good value from merchants that I do business with. One day, the legless man was not on the sidewalk. Time passed and the banker forgot about him until he walked into a public building and there in the concession stand sat the former beggar. He was obviously the owner of his own small business now. I've always hoped you might come by someday, the man said. You are largely responsible for me being here. You kept telling me that I was a merchant. I started thinking of myself that way. Instead of a beggar receiving gifts, I started selling pencils, lots of them. You gave me self-respect and caused me to look at myself differently. Doesn't that just sound like Hebrews 10, 24? Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. How do we do that? With a word of appreciation, a pat on the back, a thumbs up, a warm smile, a hug, a firm handshake, a knowing nod, an email, a text message, a social media post, a private message, a shared pot of coffee, a small gift, a single flower. Let's make Christianity a breath of fresh air in the stale world of sin, an atmosphere where brethren encourage, not discourage, where they help and not hinder, where they stir each other up for love and good works. The chapter comes to a conclusion with a warning here. Don't neglect to meet together. Don't forsake our meetings together. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice of sins, 
but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. This is not about stumbling into sin or this is, this is someone deliberately choosing to sin, planning it out, working the plan that they have devised for themselves in order to sin. The writer says, you need to stop that and think about the atoning blood of Jesus and how it operates on our behalf and how you are setting that aside when you stop seeking God and start choosing sin. Because when you do that, the sacrifice of sins no longer remains when we will willfully persist in sin. You know, the book of Hebrews has been all about the good news of Jesus, who has provided for us the purification for our sins and then sat down at the right hand of God. But this, this passage right here, is absolutely frightening. In fact, some translations have terrifying expectation of judgment. This is when the penalty for our sins is no longer being paid by Jesus, but is paid by us. And notice the continuation of the parallels between the law of Moses and the law of Christ, this, the first covenant and the second covenant. The Hebrew writer asks a question here. What do you think happens? What happens when a person under the law of Moses sets aside the law? What happens to those who reject the law of Moses and refuse to obey? That person dies without mercy. There was no mercy to be obtained. There was no pardon. There was no forgiveness. There was no sacrifice for sins. The law demanded that the person who rejected the law was to be put to death. Now notice verse 29 here. How much worse punishment will be deserved? There is a worse punishment to be executed now. This is an argument from the lesser to the greater. If a person died without mercy for rejecting the law of Moses, how much worse do you think it will be if we set aside the law of Christ? Of course, it will be far worse. Notice how God defines one who chooses to persist in sin. He is trampling the Son of God underfoot. He is profaning the blood of the covenant, saying it's not holy, that it's, it's no better than the blood of bulls and goats, who's insulted the spirit of grace or outraged the spirit of grace. One commentator writes, Since God provided an offering, and that offering is disdained or repudiated, there is nothing more that God can or will do. Why would we think that there remains any relationship with God? We have rejected God's law, and God sees this as trampling the Son of God, treating the blood of the covenant as unholy and common, and saying that the words of grace given by the Holy Spirit are nothing. Therefore, what does God say? Vengeance is mine, I will repay. We ought to be terrified at the thought of rejecting God by continuing to persist in sin. The writer wraps up the warning here in verse 32 by reminding his readers about how they endured in their past and their need to continue to endure. The writer reminds them of all they endured after they had come to the knowledge of the truth. They endured a hard struggle with sufferings. They were being exposed to public mockings and afflictions. They were even willing to stand side by side with those who endured such hostility. They showed compassion to those who were imprisoned. They accepted the robbery of their property. In the face of all of these problems and sufferings, they were able to endure because they knew they had a better possession and everlasting possession. When we know that we have a better and lasting possession, that means we're not paralyzed by loss. We will not break under the pressures exuded by the world. We won't throw our faith away when we lose something. But notice, it is not that these Christians were not just paralyzed. They rejoiced at their loss. They joyfully accepted it. The possession we have is so much better and so long-lasting that if we have things and we lose it, it's okay. Our reward is so great that we can endure anything. Verse 35, therefore, don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Look at what you've already endured, he says. Don't give up now. Don't throw away your confidence that you have. Keep doing the will of God during these times of suffering, because when you have done God's will, you will receive the promised reward. The writer then takes two quotes, verses 37 and 38, and puts them together here. The first part is from Isaiah 26 and verse 20. 
And then the rest comes from Habakkuk 2, verses 3 and 4. The righteous live by faith. We're not putting our trust and confidence in the things of this world. Our faith is not supposed to be found in the physical material things. If it is, then when we suffer tragedy and loss, we'll just shrink back and give up. However, God has no pleasure in those who give up. And notice verse 39, the last verse of the chapter, makes that very point. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. We will not be the people who make the mistake of giving up on God. We will not be the ones who reject the law of God. We will not be people who lose heart and lose their faith. We are those who have faith, and we will preserve ourselves through that faith. Now, there are only two possibilities for us. Either we will shrink back under the weight of life's difficulties and be destroyed, or we will have endurance and place our faith in God and preserve ourselves before the fury of fire. Don't turn to the things of the world for your comfort. Don't turn away from God. Don't listen to the lies of Satan. We are in a world that thinks that we cannot live up to the things that we preach, who believes that we are hypocrites for what we do. And it is because we all do fall short of the glory of God. But don't give up. Don't try to find pleasure and satisfaction in the things of this world, in the pleasures of sin, the passing pleasures of sin. Because true satisfaction comes from God, not from these physical, temporary things on this world. Thanks be to God for the greater possession that lies in heaven. Thanks so much. We'll see you tomorrow. When all of my labors and trials are over, and I am safe